All right. Well, I wanted to thank Marsha and also um, go back to one of the slides that she had mentioned, the Nina Simon slide on the Museum of Art and History. And um, the idea of activating as a welcoming um, gathering place to find, spark, share, and preserve stories and ideas with the ultimate goal of creating stronger communities and that are more connected. As we envision our new ways to collaborate and engage with the community, what sort of, oh, there we go, what sort of collaborative organizational structures are needed to build those lifelong learning ecosystems? And how will this impact our staff structure, training, and communication among staff and with the community? How do we redefine our service area online and on-site to integrate users, the physical infrastructure, and our online presence? So we'll explore um, integrating our online audience this afternoon, but now we're going to start with organizational structure and training to strengthen our service and create a, an environment that's welcoming, that gathering place. So our next speaker comes to us from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, recognized throughout the world as a leading attraction, hosting over 2 million visitors per year. Last year, the aquarium was recognized by TripAdvisor as the best aquarium in the world. David Rosenberg is the general manager of guest experience and is responsible for all visitor-facing operations, including admissions and memberships, volunteer docents, training and staff volunteer development, informal education, theatrical programming and development, innovation, aquarium adventures, security and emergency preparedness, food services, merchandising, and many other strategic development areas. All of those areas that encompass um, the visitor experience. So before joining the Monterey Bay Aquarium in 2007, his career included positions at Walt Disney World and the Hyatt Hi Hotels Corporation. So going back to Marsha's point about blurring the lines between for-profit and non-profit, his experience certainly draws from both. So please help me welcome David Rosenberg to the stage. Yeah, what a great introduction and following up after Marsha is just um, such, an, such an honor. I, uh, as, as was said, I am the general manager at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and boy, it's a fun place to be. I must tell you, it's a great place. I've been there for uh, eight years, and about eight years ago, we, were, we always knew that we were really well known for our exhibits and, uh, and, and the, the overall experience that we had, but the part that was missing was, what is the guest experience, and how do we take all the people that are out front, all the volunteers that are out front, tie them together to really create this amazing guest experience. And that was the birth of this title, guest experience. We took everything that happens out front to the visitor, all the humans, put them all together, and we created this big group. And then I got the honor, I was actually consulting for that at that time, but I got the honor of being hired to be the general manager over that as well. Great. So let, let me jump in on a, uh, a quote that back eight years ago when we were trying to figure out this guest experience and, and what it was. I remember uh, finding this, and it says, others will love what you love, but you must show them how. Right? Others will love what you love, but you must show them how. And I had a great story to tell you today about why I really like this quote, but I, on the airplane last night coming over here, I thought of an even more relevant story and something that's happened just yesterday for me. We... Uh, Amanda knows that I, I came in late last night because my children wanted to go to a Little League Day where the San Francisco Giants took on the Diamondbacks, go Giants. And we were, at, it's a, it was a big deal because the Little League team, the Ponies, which are the eight, nine, ten year olds, got invited to come see the game and to have lots of special activities. So we got there at nine o'clock yesterday morning and we got to meet the players. We, they gave talks about what inspired them to do what they do. The kids then went out and ran the bases, ran around the bases, ran out into the outfield, came back in, watched the game, and then after the game, got to go out and have balls and get their autographs. And they talked to some of their best, their most proud players, the people that they really love. My daughter met Buster Posey, which is the best thing that's ever happened to her. <laughs> I don't know why, and, uh, which is great. And, uh, and so we walked away, we have our signed our sign baseballs, and off we went. So now, let's fast forward. It was... Uh, almost six o'clock last night by the time we left the ballpark, and my family is taking me to San Francisco airport to drop me off to fly here. And as we're driving, my, uh, my son, who's eight and has been doing Little League for a very long time and has been to a lot of baseball games, he looks up at me and he goes, Dad, you know, I've always told you I want to be an architect, right? And I said, yes. 
and he's been saying this. He has been saying this since he was three. Now, I know he's eight, but he's been, Dad, I always said I want to be an architect. But I've changed my mind. I said, well, good. What do you want to be now? I want to be a baseball pitcher. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And then my daughter, who's now almost 11, always said she wants to be a school teacher. She whispers, and she looks forward to me, and she's all serious, and she goes, Dad, me too. And that was inspiration to me. That was that they got out, they met those players, they've been to lots of baseball games before, never said this, but by having these direct interactions with the players, they engage in a whole different way. They got that guest experience, and that's what we're all about, is engaging people in different ways and inspiring them to do something different. And that happened in my car on the way to the airport yesterday. Oh my gosh. So with that, we've already kind of talked a little bit about my background, but I, I kind of want to dive in a little bit more about it so I can tell you how it ties into what we did in Monterey. Um, Walt Disney World, I started my career there back when I was in college and then a little bit there after college. And people always ask me two questions when I say I worked at Disney World. One, where did you work? And two, what character were you? So I'm going to answer both of those. One, where did I work? I worked in, um, in a couple areas, but the latter part of my career I was with the casting, which is human resources, and professional staffing. And we spent a lot of time not only hiring people, but talking about how to develop them before they went out to talk to the visitor. The second question, what character was I? I was Goofy. Go figure. Do I look like Goofy? I was a perfect height. I got to be selected as Goofy. So yes, I was Goofy for one day at the Magic Kingdom. After five years at Walt Disney World, I got recruited to Hyatt Hotels Corporation, where I spent the next 11 years progressing through the ranks of, of the hotels. I moved all over the world, ran lots of hotels from big convention properties to small resorts, and the latter part of my career, I was the fix-it guy. So if something was not going quite right at your hotel, or if you're opening a hotel, closing your hotel, or doing something out of the ordinary, in came David Rosenberg. And so I wasn't always the best person that you wanted to see show up, because that meant something was going on. But that was my career with Hyatt, which ultimately brought me to Monterey, where I met lots of people around the aquarium as they were figuring out this guest experience part, helped out a little bit with that, and ultimately I found myself at the helm of that, that big initiative. So that's my background. Now, I think everybody's heard of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We're on the other coast of California. We're off the, the, the north side. Um, we uh, are known for the beautiful coastlines. In fact, we were talking about golf this morning, the great golf that we have in Monterey. We're also known for our iconic exhibits. Clearly, we have amazing exhibits. And one-of-a-kind animals, really uh, animals that you probably cannot see anyplace else in the world, such as great white sharks. We're the only aquarium in the world that's ever um, displayed great white sharks, and we've exhibited six of them over the last couple of years. But we're also, that's just a piece of what we are, we have over 500 paid staff members and 1,200 unpaid staff members, or docents, that help to carry that mission from the start to finish and connect with our visitors to make sure that we're inspiring them throughout their visit. And let me tell you, our people are truly amazing. They really create these amazing experiences. In fact, when we started concentrating on the staff and really looking at how can we take this cohesive experience from the time somebody buys our ticket well before they arrive to well after they leave our, our, um, our, our place, we realized, hey, people are starting to talk about other things too. In fact, people on TripAdvisor and Yelp are not only commenting about the aquarium, but they're commenting about the people. They're saying, I came to see the animals, and I left remembering the people that I interacted with. My gosh, they're remembering the people that they saw. That's guess experience. That is a true success that we had that. And I, I actually challenge you to go on TripAdvisor now and kind of look at our comments, because you'll see we got lots of different comments. But every second or third comment, we'll mention our people, our volunteers, our programs, ways that they engage with us. And so we were really happy to see that. Now, eight years ago, when we were talking about guest experience, we were saying, okay, what should we even call this? At that point, we didn't call it guest experience. This idea of creating this cohesive experience on the, on the human side from start to finish was still relatively new in the field. And we were trying to come up with a name. So I was just flipping around in Google, doing all these things, visitor experience, visitor, visitor services, which is a ticketing. And I hit this, guest experience. And this is the definition that came up. It was a noun which I thought was, huh, okay, that's yeah, a noun. I can see it could be the adjective, it could be a verb, but it was a noun. The perfect guest experience is one in which results in customers becoming advocates for the company, creating referrals, retention, and profitable growth. Okay, 
I like that. So that, 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 that works. So we decide, okay, guest experience. This is kind of how, what we're going to call ourselves. But then we start asking questions about me in particular. Why is my background, I just told you about my background, it's hotels, attractions, and educational institutions. Why does my background really make me qualified to help to develop a guest experience? I'm not a museum guy. I, I'm not a museum guy. I've gone to quite a few museums. I visit all, probably most of your museums, but I'm not a museum guy. So what about my background connects all those together? And we played. We said perfect balance is, okay, it's hospitality. It's themes. It's quality. You need to have hospitality, themes, and quality to tie things together. We dove a little further and said, okay, hospitality. That's the staff. That's getting the staff out that are trained, that could get in front of the visitor. Get the people out there. Make them available. Themes. What happens at the beginning? What happens at the end? And what happens to everything in between? Now, at Disney, we're a themed attraction, right? We definitely have lots of themes that, that carry out. But we also have one theme from start to finish. It's a cohesive experience. It doesn't break down right in the middle. So it's a theme that carries all the way through. And then quality. You can have your themes, you can have hospitality, but man, if you don't have quality, you're broken. All it takes is that one non-quality interaction and everything falls apart. So we had to create quality and build that quality to carry that all the way through. And then we even went further. How do we create that? We create experiences that involve interactions with staff. We couldn't just count on visitors to go and find staff. We had to create those opportunities. Staff had to be in the right areas. We did timing studies. We watched our visitor to know where we can get them to interact with our staff. We created those experiences. We created interactions in all areas, the beginning, the end, and the middle. The beginning, the end, and fill in the middle. The middle was key because that's some place that a lot of places broke down. And we said, said to ensure that every interaction, once again, is truly memorable and truly makes sense. People don't want to waste their time with an interaction that doesn't make sense. So we had to create all that. And again, that carried back that hospitality, themes, and quality, which ultimately are creating lots of experiences like this. So I've been lucky. I, uh, over the last eight years, I'm, I, I sit on the board of directors for the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, which is, uh, represents attractions throughout the world. And uh, on that, as, long as, as well as my work with the aquarium, I get to travel all over the world. And I'll tell you, it's like getting an MBA in international business. It's been a lot of fun to get to travel all over. It, it starts to look like it's a small world after all when you, uh, when, when you, when you look at the places I got to go over the last couple of years. But one thing I always look at when I go to new attractions or new cultures is what is their sense of welcome? How are they engaging their visitors? And what's that guest experience? And I love talking about Asia. I love talking about Asia because I've really, again, got to go to quite a few attractions throughout Asia. And boy, do they nail that welcome experience. I have never walked into any place in Asia that did not make me feel like I was on top of the world. I was the guy walking in. And they really created these experiences that, that ultimately got me in. And then I went to Japan. And I also saw the same thing. Just a great experience. People standing out. How can you not feel welcome when you have people standing out in these uniforms and really there to greet you? But as I stood there, I saw these two people as I walked up. And then I started looking around, and I realized not only is there two people at the front, but there's a total of seven people waiting to greet me as I walked through the door. Seven full-time employees were waiting to greet me when I got in. Again, I felt like I'm amazing. I got going. They got me a map. They really set my expectations for my visit. Now, what the slide doesn't tell you is that's the last time I saw any staff until well after I left the aquarium. So I walked in. They set my expectations at the beginning. My gosh, I was going to have a great experience. There's people that got me really excited to be there. They were going to create this great experience, and I never saw another person throughout that, aquarium, that, that, that experience. Talk about an inconsistent experience. And that's something I saw in lots of institutions that I travel around Asia. So... I'm going to talk to you a little bit more than just about some of the really grassroots basics that we did in Monterey to, to pull off what we consider to be the guest experience. And I'm not suggesting that you're going to go back and take every single one of these tidbits, but I hope that you do get some good energy pills out of this. But think about what I'm talking about, again, some of the things that we do, and how you might be able to implement those at your organization. So what are those basics? How are they working for us? And uh, take that to a higher level, because I'm going to give you really the grassroots of it to how you might be able to bring some of this back, because we all are from big, small, visitor-facing, non-visitor-facing 
attractions institutions throughout Balboa and throughout the world. So here's three areas. First, build communications, right? And we talked about uh, a little bit just about my communications that happen when we got to get, get to places and that welcome experience that we have. But communications in any attraction, any place, any hotel is always number one. Now I told you with Hyatt, as I traveled around the world or with Hyatt, I would go and help to solve issues that were happening at different, different hotels. And I'll tell you, when I went into a hotel that was broken, if something was broken at a hotel, the number one thing I would find is it was a breakdown in communications. They did not establish the very core item that keeps them ticking, which was a really good communication tool. So ask yourself, what are you doing? How do you guarantee communications at your facilities? Who can tell me, actually, let me just, let me just see hands for people in the audience. Who feels that your organization has good communications? <laughs> that's, the ex that's the response I expected. <laughs> so if you're not in here, you can see that we, we had um, maybe about a fifth of the audience raise their hand saying, saying that they had good communications. And even with that, their hands went up kind of slow. So good communications, what, a, what an arbitrary term, right? It's good communications, are you talking about vertical communication? Are you talking about horizontal communication? Are you talking about email? What is good communication, electronic, in person? How do you get good communications? And by the way, when I say that we work on enhancing communication, it's not just work looking at that electronic communication and saying, hey, don't hit reply all because that's bad communication. It's really tying that all together. So when you're creating good communication, it's making sure that we're getting the word out to the people that are on the floor, people that are in front of our visitors, and as well as throughout the organization. Now, eight years ago, again, when I reflect, I said, let's, let's come up with just some really core things, some really basics that will take communication. Forget all that electronic stuff. Forget all the written communication that we have. We're all good at that. Man, we can generate documents. Man, we can generate paper. But let's just get really to that human component. What human component can we do that will help to enhance communications? And we came up with a little bit of a laundry list of what that could be. So the first area was um, to create stand-up meetings. Really basic. Create up stand-up meetings. Now, in hotels, uh, has anybody read The Ritz-Carlton Way? It's a, uh, if you're in hotel management, you read that book. It talks about how Ritz-Carlton, 20 years ago, really built their brand, how they built communications. It's ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. It's a really good book. I really encourage it, by the way, if you haven't read that, to read that. But one of the core things it talks about was the value of face-to-face -face communication, creating a stand-up meeting. Now, as I traveled around the world, I got the ability to go and look at people, at um, the organizations that had stand-up meetings, because I was curious how people do it. And one of my favorite stories is I called a friend of mine in Korea when I was um, going to South Korea, and I said, hey, can I come see your stand-up meeting? And he said, absolutely, David. Be there at 6.30 in the morning, and we will be there. We're going to be there waiting for you. Make sure that don't get there at 629 because we won't be there yet. And don't get there at 631 because you'll be too late. Get there at 630 in the morning. So sure enough, at 630 in the morning, I'm walking up, and this is what I see. And that was their, their stand-up meeting. Now, they, they, they got the concept. They got the concept, but this is not what I'm encouraging. I'm not encouraging a vertical communication, top-down um, communication like this. However, they still were getting the word out to some degree. Now, what we started in hotels and what I've carried over to Monterey is the morning stand-up meeting. Every day at 8.30, which is a better time, we meet right in the middle of the aquarium. We stand in a circle. All the people that are, are available at that time have to come. We stand in a circle, and one by one, we go around that circle and just talk about what's important for the day. And that stand-up meeting might have 20, might have 40 people. It's, it's mostly the people that are on the, at 8.30. It's more management-type people or program presenters. And we get through that within 8 to 10 minutes. And that stand-up meeting, creating a daily communication that happens seven days a week, no matter what happens, was probably one of the easiest things that we created and one of the best things that we created. And just by doing that, we never, nobody ever says that we don't have good, good communication throughout the aquarium. We create weekly managers' meetings. Everybody, who has weekly meetings with their management? Good. So I see about, probably about a third of the hands went up. Again, simple. Create weekly manager meetings. And I say weekly manager meetings, but whatever the structure is, it's creating weekly meetings and having a defined timeline when a communication is going to happen. Get people in the room for that. Monthly all staff meetings. 
the Monterey Bay Aquarium once a month. We take all the staff into the, our auditorium, and we talk about not only what's happening, but we get them jazzed. They're excited. We talk about all the cool things going on in Monterey, things that are coming up. The summer's almost here. We have a department that will come up and talk about something cool that they've done. So on a monthly basis, we get everybody jazzed. We even go as far as the seasons to make sure that the seasons are getting, are getting ready. This is our, our, um, our pep rally for a season. And um, I, I love this picture because this was our last season pep rally as we're getting ready for the summertime. But um, it's, again, it created a different form of communication that was not just a vertical communication, but having it all the way around. We got people just to have fun together. Once again, a really basic way of communication. We even went as far as office moves. Now, um, Hewlett Packard wrote a great book, uh, or there's a great book about Hewlett Packard, and how back when HP was building up, they removed all offices, and they created a communal environment where everybody, no matter what your job was, were all in one area. So we stole that. And in, uh, eight, again, eight years ago in Monterey, we went and we got rid of all of our um, offices, or a lot of our offices, and we had our program presenter sit next to a supervisor of operations, who's next to a trainer, who's next to a manager, who's next to a director. And you'd be amazed by the organic conversations that have started by just moving people around. And by the way, about once a quarter, we'll do some more movement, just to keep it all fresh. So moving people around, office locations, is, is is key, and even the break areas where they go to break. So when people go to break, again, it's causing them to have to have communications and talk amongst each other. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go as far as Google did here on, on, on a break room, but it's amazing when you walk into a break room and you hear the, the, the conversations that are happening. People are talking about their day, they're talking about their lives. Communications are happening in that break room that you would never see anyplace else, anywhere. So again, creating places where people can come together and your staff can all work together. Just some of those core things, and of course there's a lot more to it, but the point I'm trying to make here is by encouraging human interaction, getting people out of that electronic media, and creating these experiences where they can come together, that builds great communication. Which, as we said, is probably job one that we all can do in an organization, big, small, anywhere in the world. So the second part, consistency. I talked about how in Japan I got up to the front and I had this great welcome and that was it. Great exhibits, but that was it. So consistency. What happens at the beginning? What happens at the end? What happens in the middle? Not only that, but if I'm a visitor or I'm a member and I come on Tuesday, what happens when I come three weeks from now on a Saturday when it's a lot more crowded? Consistency. How do you build consistency in an organization? And I'm going to go back now, look for hands again. In your organization, who can say, without me further defining consistency, you have consistent organization? You have a consistent, maybe I should go further, a consistent guest experience in your organization. Okay, good. So I'd say about a third of the audience raised their hand. A consistent experience in your organization. Now, in hotels, what I would find when I would go in and, and into a hotel, is an inconsistent um, hotel would have a great front desk, perhaps, but then the housekeeping was terrible. Or they would have great food and beverage. They're really well known for the food and beverage. This is something that a lot of hotels fall into. They figure out that food and beverage side, but they don't quite have it dialed in on the other side. So it's inconsistent. It confuses the visitor. If you have an inconsistent experience, what, what, what's going on? How do, you, um, how do you get the mission? So I'll tell you now a couple of core things that, 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 that not only I implemented in um, Monterey, but I've actually helped to implement in other places um, that I visited. And I find that these are just truly valuable to build that all up. Now, I listed these departments here. Um, Amanda kind of gave the, the laundry list of departments that are part of guest experience, which I'm ultimately responsible for. But these departments all, at, in, all lied in different areas of our aquarium. So for instance, admissions was part of marketing, ambassadors was part of training, security was part of human resources, and the list goes on. These are all part of different areas. So to break down the silos, build that consistent experience so they're not all marching to their own drummer, we put them all together and again create this guest experience. And we did some fun things. First, we did something basic. We got rid of, we looked at the uniforms. Now uniforms are one of the biggest opportunities to tell people that we're cohesive, and it's also one of the biggest opportunities to give a subliminal message that we are not all together. Uniforming or appearance in general 
in my opinion, is critical to creating that consistent experience. Now, about four years ago, I went to visit, uh, I went to Malaysia, and I got to experience the, um, the opening for Legoland Malaysia. And I love Legoland, by the way. And um, so I was there for an hour before, and um, finally it's right before opening, and they said, come over here and watch this. And out comes the staff from all over the, the park, and they go and they do this flash mob dance. And this goes on for 10 minutes. This is a 10 minute flash mob dance. And they're sweating, and they're just totally getting at it. And the audience is over there on the right. They're waiting to go through the turnstiles because the turnstiles aren't going to light up until the flash mob is over. Now, the story this slide doesn't tell you is it was about 100 degrees. It was about 100% humidity. And you know, you always hear the stories of mosquitoes this big. They do exist because they were right there in, in, in Malaysia while I was waiting to get inside of Legoland. So they're out there. The staff are miserable after the 10 minutes. There's sweat coming off everybody. And, uh, um, and when they were done, they uh, went off back to their areas and fired up the rides, fired up the, 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 the ticketing, fired up whatever it was that they were going to start, um, start get to, to get going. And then in came the staff. Now, the red people went off to the red area. The blue people went off to the blue zone, whatever that was that they're going to operate. The management types went off to the side to start managing. And everybody went off into their respective areas, possibly their silos, to start, to start um, running the day. Now, I had a great experience. I, I, the, the Legoland Malaysia, if you ever get a chance, is a great place to go visit. But it was also a reminder of how uniforming or appearance or how people present themselves really can create these silos that should not exist in, when you go to visit someplace. Now, I've had fun in, uh, in Monterey to kind of take that back and say, how can we, what can we do with that? And we went and took all those departments that I listed before, and we said, we're going to have one uniform, one look. Even if you're a manager, just one look. So it's a little, you know, we, we have a little bit of nuances, but overall, it's blue. Same name tag, it's blue, and that creates that experience. So when somebody comes in and they say, they buy their ticket, they're going to have the same type of look and the same type of experience that they're going to get when they get inside and talk to one of our docents or when they see a program. We also found something really, really creative. People that saw, had a great interaction at the beginning, when they saw that person in the name tag and they saw that uniform, they were more likely to go and approach one of our employees, our visitors, our, our volunteers during their visit than if they didn't have that interaction at the beginning. So again, we created this interaction that was consistent all the way through. The look was consistent and invited our, staff, our visitors to continue to engage with our staff throughout the visit. The next big area was training. We need to have good training from start to finish. And each staff member needs to have the same level of training. Now, a lot of organizations will have human resources, and human resources will go and do that first week of, of training to get everybody up and going, and then off they go into their jobs. In hotels, we had training that would mirror what I just said. We'd have human resources, we'd get things going, we'd kick it off, and then we'd send them off to their departments, and then they would learn about their departments and get that going. But what that created was lots of different levels of training. Man, a front desk, a front desk can train. They knew how to train people. Housekeeping knew how to train people on how to get that room done. But they weren't training people on customer service. So standard training from start to finish from all the employees that interact, whether it's the admissions, program presenters, to our scientists, to our food and beverage presenters, all have one level of training. They all carry that same level, that same message, that same level of interpretation and that same ability to inspire. So training was really a critical thing that we, we grabbed onto. Standard messages. What I always found is uh, everybody wants a different message. So it, it's, uh, hey, I'm cool. I want to I wanna make sure that you, you hear my message. Um, but we want to make sure that the standard message is happening all the way through. Again, in an aquarium, that's what is the message? Well, we have a mission. It's to inspire ocean conservation. Does everybody know that message? Is that message being carried all the way through? Are we getting that message out? So standard messaging that happens from the beginning to end, from the human side, also into our labeling side. The standard mission. And I love this one because, especially in this audience, we're most likely all mission-driven organizations. The standard mission. So I, I told you in Monterey, it's to inspire ocean conservation. That's our mission statement. Very simple. Everybody knows it. We all have it. But one thing we worked really hard on was not only to talk about the mission, because the mission was written on paper, it was people dressed up like me today that wrote it down, 
but how does that mission resonate for each person in an organization? So the 2,000 or so people that, that work in an organization, how does the mission resonate? And I'll give you some examples of as we got people really on board with it and we taught them how it resonates with them, they started coming up with ideas. For instance, our divers. Our divers who might say, hey, I don't really contribute to the mission. I'm, I'm all about diving and fixing facilities and doing other things. Well, they, they understand our mission. They understand that it's to inspire ocean conservation. Our dive team came up with an idea of taking children scuba diving in our tide pool and connecting them with the wild. Our volunteer desk, our volunteers that work our information desk, came up with the concept that, hey, if I help people to take their special experience, so they're here to celebrate a birthday or anniversary, and really make that even bigger, bigger than life itself, they're going to feel inspired. They're going to feel inspired not only by what we do, but they're going to help to connect to our mission. So helping to help them understand how to connect. And then our Aquarium Adventures team, our, our fee-based programs, they said, let's go ahead and uh, create romance tours. Let's go and create this, this opportunity where people, I know it sounds so silly, right? But that romance and people that want to get engaged or whatever that is at, at the aquarium, let's help them to really take that to a new level. And I'll tell you what, what we find is when people have one of these experiences at our aquarium, they become our donors, they are our members, and ultimately they help to help us to inspire ocean conservation. So that they create those experiences. So my point being is these three teams of staff, they understood the mission, and they figured out how they connect to the mission, and they helped us to figure out new ways to connect our visitors to the mission. And that was really a big eye-opener for me about how staff that understands it can carry it further. So back to these departments, using that, creating a consistent experience from the beginning to the end and everything in between was really a critical part of what we did in Monterey. It's a critical thing at hotels, and I imagine it's a critical part of all organizations, have that critical, that, that consistent experience. The third area, and I think I would argue probably one of the most important areas, is to build that team. Build the team, right? Pretty easy. We need to build a good team. David, build a good team. Because we build a good team, they're going to be out there, they're going to have energy, and they're going to carry things through. Now, I'll tell you, building a good team is not quite as easy as it sounds. It's not just interviewing people and, um, and making sure that you get the right people in the door. But it's a lot more than that. So I want to give you some of my tips, some tips that I use for tips for building an amazing, outstanding, awesome team. How do you, how do you build that amazing, outstanding team? The first part is who knew, who thinks that over 50% of your turnover happens in the first 90 days of employment. Isn't that astonishing? 50% of your turnover, that's half your staff, well, half of the people that you hire, I should say, turn over in the first 90 days of employment. Damn, that's expensive. So you're, you got these people at the first couple of weeks, they're just learning their job, they're barely getting in and helping you out, they're really productive, and they leave. And not only that, but you gotta get the right people in the door in the first place. Because if you don't have the right people in the place, you're not even getting to that 90%. So that's what I've always concentrated on. When I went around to hotels, and if I was ever looking at a hotel that had a challenge, I would always find that that 90% turnover was through the roof. It was like chasing your tail. Chasing your tail for that first 90 days. You had staff coming in, going. That was a big challenge that we would see. People cannot have turnover in the first 90 days. That's a huge investment and that needs to be fixed. So I have a little bit of a graph that I've used over the years to help to say, not only how do we get people past that 90 days, but what happens after that 90 days? We got them over that hurdle, so they're probably gonna stay, but we also don't want them to become complacent. We need to carry them through. So let me kind of break you, talk this through with you. So first is the audition process, right? We hire somebody, you gotta hire the right person. Get the right person in the door. That's not just an interview. You cannot just sit down and interview somebody, you gotta get them into the environment. Monterey Bay Aquarium, we bring them out into the floor, we have them walk around, they tell me about the exhibits, how they feel about the exhibits. I don't really care if they really are knowledgeable about it, but I wanna see how they perceive what the guest is perceiving. So we walk them around. We bring them into team building exercises. We actually have them with another applicant to talk about a problem and see how they work together as a team. And I'll tell you what, somebody always bubbles to the top when you do that, because you're looking for leaders in this. So team building exercises, this is all part of the audition process. Get them in the door, put them together, get, them, get the right people into the, uh, on board. And then of course they go into the new hire process. We all have some sort of new hire process. Whether it's volunteer docents or paid staff, we bring them through that. That might be some of the basics, safety. 
but it's also what is it that you want them to know about your organization. So that, that, that does exist in all areas. In Monterey, it's a one-week process where we, go, we do what's called welcome days. We actually not only bring them on board, but put them out on the floor and tell them to be visitors for a week, for a whole week. They're visitors. We make sure they see every single component of our attraction, our museum, our aquarium, because we want to make sure that they understand the visitor's perspective. Busy, slow, everything else. We get them out on the floor and we get that all going. And then we start to dive into the, the longer term items. Now, you gotta give over that 90 days, but training is not just a one-time kick. It's not a one-time pill, right? So uh, when, I, when I look at some hotels, I find that they have that one week training where they come in and they say, okay, we're gonna make a guest services person out of you. You're gonna come in, you're gonna sit here in human resources, we're gonna train you how to be friendly. Right? We're going to teach you how to be friendly, and then we're going to tell you, you better look, and by the way, point with two fingers. Have a nice day. And then they go off after that week, and they go into their departments to learn about what those departments are. Well, that doesn't work. It's got to be an evolution. It's got to be ongoing, always happening. Training never stops. And if it does stop, you're not going to have people that feel inspired. You're not going to have staff that want to stay around for too long. So some quick little items that help with that is what I call a quick tip or a daily tip. Every day, any organization that I've managed, every day will have a tip for the day. And that tip might go for one minute, might go for five minutes, but it's a tip of the day that each time I give you these tips throughout time, it's going to build on the skill. Five minutes a day. I'm sure you can give up five minutes a day, right? To talk about something that will help to build a staff member. So in Monterey, we actually have these quick tips that go out to the entire staff of the aquarium and all the volunteers for that day about a specific skill. And the next day, we're going to talk about another skill. And the next day, we're going to talk about another skill. So for five minutes a day, we're continuously building these, this staff and these volunteers to become better and better at what they do. And a quick tip might look like this if we're, when we write it down. Um, this is one of my favorites, by the way. It's a very basic one. It's the smile. You need a smile, right? If you don't smile, you're not gonna, you're gonna have, um, people aren't gonna wanna approach you. If they're not gonna wanna approach you, they're not gonna talk to you. If they don't talk to you, you're not gonna create that experience. So we talk about all the different areas that go into a smile. But we actually do a little exercise with the, with the smile tip it as well. We take them into the bathroom before we open, which is a lot of fun for staff, by the way. <laughs> and, and we go into the bathroom and I put the staff in front of a mirror and we talk about smiling. We have them smile, we have them frown, we have them talk about what they just saw, and we're done. Quick tip is over for the day. And let me tell you, this one smile quick tip, which I'll do about once a quarter, carries for the next three months, because everybody always goes, remember the bathroom when you weren't smiling? <laughs> the smile quick tip is one of the best things, and so easy to do, and that's just an idea of one quick tip that, 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 that happens. But every day needs to have a tip. Continuing education. You always, um, it, not only do we have the quick tips, but like, classes. Everybody has classes. If you're, if you're about photography, education about the, f the, the, the photography in your exhibits. Education, build the people well beyond just what you can do in a daily quick tip. Get them in the classroom settings. The uh, continuous improvement in coaching. Um, I like to use the example of admissions because in the admissions area, people get really good at using the cash register, but they need to continuously improve on that. What happens is they become complacent. They can become really fast, and they forget the core part, which is I need to talk to the person in front of me. So continuous improvement, coaching them on that, and constant reminding to build those, to build those skills and carry them one step further. More skill development, review everything that you learned, get them out of their normal place where they work, get them out there to keep reviewing everything that they have, and then you create this great circle. So it's ongoing. The quick tips are happening every day. We always have new, new classes that are coming out and about or new things that people can learn. We're looking at the skills that people have and we're making them better. We're honing in on different skills and then we're making it all happen again. And it's constantly going around in a circle. It's always happening. It's an evolution. Love talking about evolution. Evolution uh, is, uh, it, it is key to keeping this going. And then of course you gotta measure your success. Shopper reports, exit surveys, evaluations. Make sure you're being successful with it. Celebrate the successes. Celebrate the successes. If you read the Ritz-Carlton way, it talks about that, that you know, there's lots of failures out there. You need to understand the failures, but celebrate the successes, because when you celebrate the successes, that rallies everybody around. You hardly talk, hear me talk about failures, and believe me, I have plenty of failures. But I'll talk about it, I'll bring it up, but that's it. 
I don't hone in on it. We don't spend a lot of time talking about the failures because if we can find one single success, that rallies everybody around it and we're able to get them going on that. So keeping the success going is key. Measure everything that happens so you know where those successes are and make sure that everybody rallies around that. And that is creating training around a great guest experience and building the great team. So one last part with uh, recognizing the staff and making sure that uh, we are celebrating those successes is the staff are always, and the volunteers will have lots and lots of successes. And of course you're gonna find those. And recognize them is not necessarily going and saying, hey, I'm gonna give you a certificate. Here's the Employee of the Month Award. Yes, you're the winner and everybody else is a loser for the month. It's, that's not it. Celebrating the successes is saying, hey, let's go and get you more involved in what you do here. I'm going to bring you in front of this, 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 this painting and help you to understand what inspires both of us about it. Let's celebrate your success with the visitor and let's go ahead and talk about this ourselves. In our case, let's go and hang out with the animals. Let's go and um, get a graduation, uh, go through a graduation ceremony or, or, or do something. There's lots of ways to celebrate successes that are really informal. And as you can see, when you take these three areas, building the communication, building the consistency from start to finish, and having the great team in between, you're gonna create results that look like this. I can tell you I'm proud to say that um, it, what we do at Monterey Bay Aquarium, we are at the highest we've ever been in just about all of our measurable areas. And every place that the guest experience influences has just been fantastic. Our availability of staff, educational experience, courtesy, inspiration, value for admission, our records show that we're just doing a fantastic job with that. And that was just doing a lot of these basic things that we talked about today. We created this guest experience that we've really become known for. And of course the most important part is the overall experience. Driving this all home, creating that, takes this overall experience and brings it to new levels. So let's go back to where we started. I put up a quote and I said, others will love what you love, you've gotta show them how. If you create the guest experience, you take your human component, your volunteers, all the parts and tie it together. You make it consistent from start to finish. You have a very high level of quality from start to finish. You get that staff out there to talk to the visitors. You don't hide them. You make it that there's no barriers. Get rid of the subliminal barriers, so uniforms, everything else. Make it so people want to talk. And you get that, you're going to take your experience to a whole new level. You're going to create this. And ultimately, these are what you're going to see out there on your floor. So with that, again, my name's David Rosenberg, and I will be here the rest of the day, so I definitely, if there's any qu um, questions later on, I'd love to talk to you about it. You can see that I'm quite, quite um, inspired by what I get to do, and uh, definitely love talking about it as well. So, um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come here. Do we have time for a few questions? We do, okay. So we have just a couple minutes, and I'd love to take a couple questions. About anything. <laughs> I was goofy, I told you that. Right. <laughs> Hi, uh, continuing education costs lots of money. Do you have departments budget the continuing education into it? Or is that paid for through human resources? Or how do, how do you figure that all out? That, that's a good question. There's, there, so two parts with our continuing education. We have a fantastic training department that is part of our human resources, and we budget that as part of our human resources. That's our institutional-wide training. So for instance, um, some of the basics, like sexual harassment training that, that, that needs to happen, or safety training, or possibly even some management classes are part of that human resource umbrella. Now what we've done that might be a little bit different is we also create a training group that's part of the guest experience division. So this, this human component, we have our own training group, and that's our interpreters, the people that train our volunteer docents, as well as the people that train all of our staff. So what you find, if you're an employee or a volunteer that comes on board, you'll meet with our human resources department and go through that, that, those first couple days of training to get, to get the, the core, and then you'll come over to guest experience, which then you'll engage with the guest experience training group that carries everything through for the rest of your time uh, of working for us or volunteering for us. And I'll tell you, that was really a, a great eye-opener because having the training part of the actual group itself allowed that, gr that training to always be molding and always changing and to conform to what's, what's current. So it's not a complacent training model. It's a, th 
this is what's going on. We have a white shark on exhibit this, uh, or coming on to exhibit. Let's have a training that goes out right now about how to interpret a great white shark. Or something happened out in the world that we know our visitors are going to come and start asking us questions. There was an oil spill. And we need to get that out right away. We've got 1,200 volunteers, 500 paid staff members that all need to say the same thing, or we're going to blow it. So by creating that training group that's within guest experience, we're able to do that and react real time and get, the, get those words out. So excellent question. Hi, David. Um, question I have for you, I also have a hospitality background. Um, how do you break down the barriers between kind of back of house, front of house, and probably between management and your visitor experience? Because I think that's an important thing is to make sure that managers also understand what the people on the front staff. So maybe you could kind of elaborate on how you've created that. I assume you've created that kind of interactions between those two departments. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, I think, a great example that's relevant in an aquarium world is we have uh, husbandry. And a zoo, of course, has husbandry as well. And th those individuals that are, are there taking care of our living collection, that's what they want to do. They want to be there to work with those animals. There's a reason they select their job. And it, now you, all of a sudden you say, hey, you're part of the guest experience. If you have a name tag on, you're going to need to come out. You're going to need to talk to our visitors. And I'll tell you, that wasn't easy. It, that, that wasn't an easy leap to go and say, hey, some of these back of the house areas, you really tie into the front. But what we're able to do is start to show the fruits of their labor. So a good example is we created behind the scenes tours. And, I, and um, a lot of zoos and aquariums do that. We never did that at Monterey Bay Aquarium up until four years ago. And to do that, that meant we're going to take visitors into the work areas of our husbandry staff. And we engaged them. We got them involved. We had them sit down with us. We talked to them about bringing visitors in. They were not overly excited about that at first. But when they started to realize, again, how they're connected to our mission and how by bringing visitors back behind the scenes was more than just a ploy to make money, it was because we were able to have further discussions with the visitors. And to have further discussions, we were able to protect the animals that the husbandry staff were, were behind. They bought into it. Not only did they buy into it, they started coming up with more ideas. So by getting all the team, this goes back to where we talked about the mission, to understand how they play towards the mission and how their work can help to support that, then that really helped us to break down a lot of those barriers and carry that. The other part of that is you said about management. And we, I put up that list of all those departments that came together. By having that management all part of one team and all talking, and every morning they're there at that 8.30 stand-up meeting, and every manager's meeting that happens once a week, and those summer kickoffs and everything else they do, it builds a really cohesive team. Um, so it's, it's, it's fantastic. The second week I, I arrived in Monterey, and I took our, took my job, we went on a trip. And we went on a trip to Disneyland. We went to Disneyland. I took him, I said, we're going to go down to Disneyland. And we spent two days walking around Disneyland. And on those two days, we went on roller coasters, of course. That's the fun part. But we had so much organic dialogue around what was the visitor experience, what was it that was standing out to each of us, and what made us unique, and how we interpreted that, that I still look back eight years, and I say that was one of the best things I could have ever done. I took the management out of their standard environment, had them come into a fun environment. We all talked about what was inspiring them and how they were connecting to that and how they can tie it back to our world. And now all those people, by the way, are also best friends. So there's lots of different ways to break down the barriers with management, and that was one thing that we did. Great. We'll take one more question, then we're going to go ahead and wrap up. So the, you were talking about daily tips, but I think on the screen it said weekly tips. So. Is it daily or weekly, and <laughs> and uh, how does that happen? Do part of the staff go to it one day, and another part of the staff go to it another day? Good question. I, I think that um, the slide says daily tips and weekly um, weekly stand ups or weekly classes. Yeah, and so what what I, what I mean by that is that daily nugget, which is a couple of minutes long. And then once a week, we try to, um, and I'm sorry I didn't touch on this, but we try to summarize everything that we talked about for that week. So if there was five different tips that went off for that week on that sixth day, we would spend maybe an extra two or three minutes trying to bring it all together and recap what we did for the week. So that's how we, we tie it all together. And as far as how do we get that to happen, well, every staff member has to check in and, and start their day. The majority of us all start at 8.30, so that morning stand-up meeting is a really good opportunity for us to get everybody together. But then they go and they carry these tips back to their departments. And each department starts throughout the day. Their managers start them, and they provide that same tip to their staff that day. 
so that message gets throughout the entire organization. That's how we do it. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you again so much. It's such an honor to be here, and enjoy the rest of the day today. <laughs>